Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's reading comes from The Filtration of Public Water Supplies, published in 1905 and written by Alan Hazen. This book looks at the early days of large-scale water filtration, beginning in the mid-1850s. My name is Teddy, and I am to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important, and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. The podcast is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. Thank you to everybody who shared their words of gratitude with me during the week. As always, I am extremely grateful to all of the patron supporters and anchor sponsors who support the show financially with a monthly contribution. Whether it's $1 or $5, your monthly contribution allows me to bring out more episodes for those who need them. If you would like to become a patron or sponsor, please visit boytosleep.com where you can support the podcast and also benefit from a good night's rest. If you find the podcast beneficial, please share the podcast with a friend who may need a good night's rest. It would also be amazing if you could. Please leave a review and comment in iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player of choice. You can find me at boytosleep.com or on Instagram at boytosleep. I always love hearing from listeners, especially those who find the podcast helpful in getting a good night's rest. In the meantime, lie back, relax, and enjoy the readings. The Filtration of Public Water Supplies by Alan Hazen The subject of water filtration is commencing to receive a great deal of attention in the United States. The more densely populated European countries were forced to adopt filtration many years ago to prevent the evils arising from the unavoidable contaminations of the rivers and lakes, which were the only available sources for their public water supplies. And it has been found to answer its purpose so well that at the present time, cities in Europe, nearly, if not quite equal in population, to all the cities of the United States, are supplied with filtered water. Many years ago, when the whole subject of water supply was still comparatively new in this country, filtration was considered as a means for rendering the waters of our rivers suitable for the purpose of domestic water supply. St. Louis investigated this subject in 1866, and the engineer of the St. Louis Water Board, the late Mr. J.P. Kirkwood, made an investigation and report upon European methods of filtration, which was published in 1869 and was such a model of full and accurate statement combined with clearly drawn conclusions that, up to the present time, it has remained the only treatise upon the subject in English, notwithstanding the great advances which have been made, particularly in the last ten years, with the aid of knowledge of the bacteria and the germs of certain diseases in water, Unfortunately, the interest in the subject was not maintained in America, but was allowed to lag for many years. It was cheaper to use the water in its raw state than it was to purify it. 
the people became indifferent to the danger of such use, and the disastrous epidemics of cholera and typhoid fever, as well as of minor diseases, which so often resulted from the use of polluted water, were attributed to other causes. With increasing study and diffusion of knowledge, the relations of water and disease are becoming better known, and the present state of things will not be allowed to continue. Indeed, at present, there is inquiry at every hand as to the methods of improving waters. The one unfortunate feature is the question of cost. Not that the cost of filtration is excessive or beyond the means of American communities. In point of fact, exactly the reverse is the case. But we have been so long accustomed to obtain drinking water without expense, other than pumping that any cost tending to improved quality seems excessive. Thus affording a chance for the installation of inferior filters, which by failing to produce the promised results, tend to bring the whole process into disrepute since few people can distinguish between an adequate filtration and a poor substitute for it. It is undoubtedly true that improvements are made and will continue to be made in processes of filtration, so it will often be possible to reduce the expense of the process without decreasing the efficiency but great care must be exercised in such cases to maintain the conditions really essential to success. In the present volume, I have endeavoured to explain briefly the nature of filtration and the conditions which, in half a century of European practice, have been found essential for successful practice, with a view of stimulating interest in the subject and of preventing the unfortunate and disappointing results which so easily result from the construction of inferior filters. The economies which may possibly result by the use of an inferior filtration are comparatively small, and it is believed that in those American cities where filtration is necessary or desirable, it will be best found in every case to furnish filters of the best construction, fully able to do what is required of them with ease and certainty. There have been several distinct epochs in the development of water purification in the United States. The first may be said to date from Kirkwood's report on the filtration of river waters and the second from the inauguration of the Lawrence Experiment Station by the Massachusetts State Board of Health, and the construction of the Lawrence City Filter, with the demonstration of the wonderful biological action of filters upon highly polluted waters. The third epoch is marked by the experiments of Louisville, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati, which have greatly increased our knowledge of the treatment of waters, containing enormous quantities of suspended matter, and have reduced to something like order the previously existing confused mass of data regarding coagulation and rapid filtration. The first edition of this book represented the early epochs before the opening of the third in the five years since it was written, progress in the art of water purification has been rapid and substantial. No apology is needed for the very complete revision required to treat these newly investigated subjects as fully as were other matters in the earlier editions. In the present edition, the first seven chapters remain, but with few editions. Experience has strengthened the propositions contained in them. 
new data might have been added, but in few cases would the conclusions have been altered. The remaining chapters of the book have been entirely rewritten and enlarged to represent the added information now available, so that the present edition is nearly twice as large as the earlier ones. In the appendices also, much matter has been added relating to works in operation, particularly to those in America. The rapid and enormous development and extension of waterworks in every civilized country during the past 40 years is a matter which deserves our most careful consideration, as there is hardly a subject which more directly affects the health and happiness of almost every single inhabitant of all cities and large towns. Considering the modern methods of communication and the free exchange of ideas between nations, it is really marvellous how each country has met its problems of water supply from its own resources, and often without much regard to the methods which have been found most useful elsewhere. England has secured a whole series of magnificent supplies by impounding the waters of small streams and reservoirs, holding enough water to last through dry periods, while on continental Europe such supplies are hardly known. Germany has spent millions upon millions in purifying turbid and polluted river waters, while France and Austria have striven for mountain spring waters and have built hundreds of miles of costly aqueducts to secure them. In the United States, an abundant supply of some liquid has too often been the objective point, and the efforts have been most successful, the American works being entirely unrivaled in the volumes of their supplies. I do not wish to imply that the quality has been entirely neglected in our country, for many cities and towns have seriously and successfully studied their problems, with the result that there are hundreds of water supplies in the United States, which will compare favourably upon any basis with supplies in any part of the world. But on the other hand, it is equally true that there are hundreds of other cities including some amongst the largest in the country, which supply their citizens with turbid and unhealthy waters, which cannot be regarded as anything else than a national disgrace and a menace to our prosperity. One can travel through England, Belgium, Holland, Germany, and large portions of other European countries, and drink the water at every city visited without anxiety as to its effect upon his health. It has not always been so. Formerly, European capitals drank water no better than that so often dispensed now in America. As recently as 1892, Germany's great commercial centre Hamburg having a water supply essentially like those of Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, New Orleans, and a hundred other American cities, paid a penalty in one month of 8,000 lives for its carelessness. The lesson was a dear one, but it was not wasted. Hamburg now has a new and wholesome supply, and other German cities, the qualities of whose waters were open to question, have been forced to take active measures to better their conditions. We also can learn something from their experience. There are three principal methods of securing a good water supply for a large city. The first consists of damming a stream from an uninhabited or but sparsely inhabited watershed, thus forming an impounding reservoir. This method is used extensively in England and the United States. 
In the latter, most of the really good and large supplies are so obtained. It is only applicable to places having suitable watersheds within a reasonable distance, and there are large regions where, owing to geological and other conditions, it cannot be applied. It is most useful in hilly and poor farming countries, as in parts of England and Wales, in the Atlantic states and in California. It cannot be used to any considerable extent in level and fertile countries, which are sure to be or to become densely populated, as is the case with large parts of France and Germany and in the Middle States. The second method is to secure groundwater, that is, spring or well water, which by its passage through the ground has become thoroughly purified from any impurities which it may have contained. This was the earliest and is the most widely used method of securing good water. It is specially adapted to small supplies under favourable geological conditions, very large supplies have been obtained in this manner. In Europe, Paris, Vienna, Budapest, Munich, Cologne, Leipzig, Dresden, a part of London, and very many smaller places are so supplied. This method is also extensively used in the United States, for small and medium-sized places, and deserves to be most carefully studied and used whenever possible, but is unfortunately limited by geological conditions and cannot be used except in a fraction of the cases where supplies are required. No groundwater supplies yet developed in the United States are comparable in size to those used in Europe. The third process of securing a good water supply is by means of filtration of surface waters, which would otherwise be unsuitable for domestic purposes. The methods of filtration, which it is the purpose of this volume to explain, are beyond the experimental stage, they are now applied to the purification of the water supplies of European cities with an aggregate population of at least 20 million people. In the United States, the use of filters is much less common and most of the filters in use are of comparatively recent installation. Great interest has been shown in the subject during the last few years and the peculiar character of some American waters, which differ widely in their properties from those of many European streams, have received careful and exhaustive consideration. In Europe, filtration has been practiced with continually improving methods since 1829, and the process has steadily received wider and wider application it has been most searchingly investigated in its hygienic relations and has been repeatedly found to be a most valuable aid in reducing mortality. The conditions under which satisfactory results can be obtained are now tolerably well known so that filters can be built in the United States with the utmost confidence that the result will not be disappointing. The cost of filtration, although considerable, is not so great as to put it beyond the reach of American cities. It may be roughly estimated that the cost of filtration, with all necessary interest and in sinking funds, will add 10% to the average cost of water, as at present supplied. It may be confidently expected that when the facts are better understood and realised by the American public, we shall abandon the present filthy and unhealthy habit of drinking polluted river water and lake waters 
and shall put the quality as well as the quantity of our supplies upon a level not exceeded by those of any country. Filtration of water consists in passing it through some substance which retains or removes some of the impurities. In its simplest form, filtration is a straining process, and the results obtained depend upon the fineness of the strainer, and this in turn is regulated by the character of the water and the uses to which it is to be put. Thus, in the manufacture of paper, an enormous volume of water is required free from particles which, if they should become embedded in the paper, would injure its appearance or texture. Obviously, for this purpose, the removal of the smaller particles, separately invisible to the unaided eye, and thus not affecting the appearance of the paper, and the removal of which would require the use of a finer filter at increased expense, would be a simple waste of money. When, however, a water is to be used for a domestic water supply, and transparency is an object, the still finer particles, which would not show themselves in paper, but which are still able, in bulk, to render a water turbid, should be as far as possible removed, thus necessitating a finer filter. And when there is reason to think that the water contains the germs of disease, the filter must be fine enough to remove with certainty those organisms so extraordinarily small that millions of them may exist in a glass of water without imparting a visible turbidity. It is now something over half a century since the first successful attempts were made to filter public water supplies and there are now hundreds of cities supplied with clear, healthy filtered water. While the details of the filters used in different places present considerable variations, the general form is, in Europe at least, everywhere the same. The most important parts of a filter are shown by the accompanying sketch, in which the dimensions are much exaggerated. The water is taken from the river into a settling basin, where the heaviest mud is allowed to settle. In the case of a lake and pond, waters the settling tank is dispensed with, but it is essential for turbid river water, as otherwise the mud clogs the filter too rapidly. The partially clarified water then passes to the filter, which consists of a horizontal layer of rather fine sand, supported by gravel and underdrained, the whole being enclosed in a suitable basin or tank. The water in passing through the sand leaves behind the sand grains, the extremely small particles which were too fine to settle out in the settling basin, and is quite clear as it goes from the gravel to the drains and the pumps which forward it to the reservoir or city. The passages between the grains of sand through which the water must pass are extremely small. If the sand grains were spherical, a one of fifty of an inch in diameter, the openings would only allow the passage of other spheres, one three hundred and twentieth of an inch in diameter, and with actual irregular sands, much finer particles are held back. As a result, the coarser matters in the water are retained on the surface of the sand, where they quickly form a layer of sediment, which itself becomes a filter much finer than the sand alone, and which is capable of holding back under suitable conditions. Even the bacteria of the passing water. 
the water which passes before this takes place may be less perfectly filtered, but even then, the filter may be so operated that nearly all of the bacteria will be deposited in the sand and not allowed to pass through into the effluent. As the sediment layer increases in thickness with continued filtration, increased pressure is required to drive the desired volume of water through its pores, which are ever becoming smaller and reduced in number. When the required quantity of water will no longer pass, with the maximum pressure allowed, it is necessary to remove by scraping the sediment layer, which should not be more than an inch deep. This layer contains most of the sediment, and the remaining sand will then act almost as new sand would do. The sand removed may be washed for use again, and eventually replaced when the sand layer becomes too thin by repeated scrapings. These operations require that the filter shall be temporarily out of use, and as a water must in general be supplied without intermission, a number of filters are built together, so that any of them can be shut out without interfering with the action of the others. The arrangement of filters in relation to the pumps varies with local conditions. With gravity supplies, the filters are usually located below the strong reservoir and properly placed, involved only a few feet loss of head. In the case of tidal rivers, as at Antwerp and Rotterdam, the quality of the raw water varies with the tide and there is a great advantage in having the settling basins low enough so that a whole day's supply can be rapidly let in when the water is at its best, without pumping. At Antwerp, the filters are higher, and the water is pumped from the settling basins to them, and again from the reservoir receiving the effluence from the filters to the city. In several of the London works, East London, Grand Junction, Southwark and Vauxhall, etc., the settling basins are lower than the river and the filters are still lower, so that a single pumping suffices, that coming between the filter and the city or elevated distributing reservoir, in many other English filters and in most German works, the settling basins and filters are placed together a little higher than the river. The water requires to be pumped twice, once before and once after filtration. At Altona, the settling basins and filters are placed upon a hill to which the raw alb water is pumped and from which it is supplied to the city after filtration by gravity without further pumping. The location of the works, in this case, is said to have been determined by the location of a bed of sand, suitable for filtration on the spot where the filters were built. When two pumpings are required, they are frequently done especially in the smaller places, in the same pumping station, with but one set of boilers and engines, the two pumps being connected to the same engine. The cost is said to be only slightly greater than that of a single lift of the same total height. In very large works, as at Berlin and Hamburg, and some of the London companies, Two separate sets of pumping machinery involve less extra cost, relatively than would be the case with smaller works. Kirkwood found in 1866 that sedimentation basins were essential to the successful treatment of turbid river waters, and subsequent experience has not in any way shaken his conclusion. The German works visited by him 
Berlin and Altona were both built by English engineers. Since that time, however, there has been a well-marked tendency on the part of the German engineers to use smaller while the English engineers have used much larger sedimentation basins, so that the practices of the two countries are now widely separated. The difference, no doubt, being in part at least due to local causes. Kirkwood found sedimentation basins at Altona with a capacity of two and a quarter times the daily supply. In 1894, the same basins were in use, although the filtering area had been increased from 0.82 acre to 2.20 acres, and still more filters were in course of construction, and the average daily quantity of water had increased from 600,000 to 4,150,000 gallons in 1891, or more than three times the capacity of the sedimentation basins. In 1890, the depth of mud deposited in these basins was reported to be two feet deep in three months. At Stralau in Berlin, also in the same time, the filtering area was nearly doubled without increasing the size of the sedimentation basins. At Magdeburg on the Elbe, works were built in 1876 with a filtering area of 1.92 acres and a sedimentation basin capacity of 11,300,000 gallons. But in 1894, Half of the latter had been built over into filters, which with two other filters gave a total filtering surface of 3.90 acres, with a sedimentation basin capacity of only 5,650,000 gallons. The daily quantity of water pumped for 1891 to 2 was 5 million gallons, so that the present sedimentation basin capacity is about equal to one day's supply, or relatively less than a third of the original provision. The idea followed is that most of the particles which will settle at all will do so within 24 hours, and that a greater storage capacity may allow the growth of algae and that the water may deteriorate rather than improve in larger tanks. And that concludes tonight's readings. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this story about water filtration. If you're not quite tired yet, please feel free to listen to another episode. In the meantime, I'll be bringing you another episode very soon.